Well, I am often asked, how do you get those bright, brilliant, intense greens under control? How do you de-intensify them so they look more natural? The methods I'll show you today not only will help you get those intense greens under control, but you'll be painting more dynamically with those greens in the process. Well, hello, minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. And today we're talking about greens, glorious greens, um, mainly the vibrant kind. And I get asked this question a lot for tips on how to deal with intense, vibrant greens, unnaturally intense, vibrant greens, so that you can use them, you know, in a painting. I'm going to put out an example here, uh, what I think is a good cross-section example of usually what we... <laughs> Are dealing with when we're talking about intense greens. So you may have a palette or a selection that includes one of these or something that fits in this category. Obviously I'm not going to put out all the intense greens. Number one I don't have them all but they usually will fit in this range. Okay this is Azo Green or in a lot of brands it's usually called Green Gold. This is the M. Graham version. This is Sminka's May Green. You'll see a lot of colors that sort of fit in that one. Spring greens, some permanent green light. The famous Thalo Green, well this is yellow shade. Cobalt Teal, which we're getting towards the blues now. This is Thalo Green Blue Shade. So you've got the two Thalos. Those are very common on palettes and very common to bringing up this question of how do you deal with Hyper intense greens. It's not easy being green. This is uh, Thalo Turquoise. And again, this just uh, shows a good cross section or primary example of what you might encounter. Greens that need to be tamed, that need to be toned down a bit. Okay. So, how do we go about that? Well, first, let me show you and just briefly talk about convenience greens because that's usually the first place people go. And I'm also not going to have a whole selection of those, but these are just examples of convenience greens. Uh, this is uh, M. Graham's Olive Green. This is one I really, really love. I use this. Uh, this is Daniel Smith's Green Appetite Genuine. It's one of their Primatec colors. Sap Green, very uh, popular one. Perylene Green by Daniel Smith, another good one. So this is a way that a lot of artists go. Uh, there's one called Hooker's Green that used to be on my palette all the time. I don't really use it anymore. There's nothing really wrong with it. Just good convenience greens that look more natural when you use them. Now there's only one problem with this and that's that a lot of artists will use them to an exclusion of anything else. Sap Green is probably one of the number one culprits. Artists will go out there and paint with sap green because it looks closest to uh, the average tree green. And they'll just use tons and tons and tons of it. And basically their painting comes out looking monochromatic. So the point here is not only to be able to de-intensify really brilliant greens, but also just to have a handle on mixing and using your colors uh, to produce greens that are lively and interesting. You could actually do the same kind of topic on any color, but really greens I think are most appropriate because so much of it gets used in landscape. But we will come back to these actually. So I have three methods or three categories that usually uh, I fit de-intensifying your greens into. And in the end, what I hope you will do is see that all three of these methods might be used at different times and even be used together. But I'm going to put them in three categories, okay? The first one, a neutralizer. Using a neutralizer. Let's look at a few, a few of the neutralizers. Neutral tent, that's a popular one. But now it's not the only one. And a neutral tent basically is a color that is not a color. It is designed to gray any color without changing its hue. So basically you'll have the same color, but it'll just be grayer and usually darker. So I'm going to get a little bit of Thalo Green Blue Shade, which is a very cool green. But here is our Thalo Green. And all my swatches, I'm just going to make little trees. This is Thalo Green in Neutral Tint. It's a nice bluish green, but it's very cool. But Neutral Tint's not the only game out there. There's also Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray would make the mixture even cooler. Adds a blue. It's going to be very similar. 
this actually is a great color for uh, like spruce and fir trees. So let's, let's make that. <laughs> However, what I think for cooler greens, uh, what I think is better is actually earth tones. These are great green neutralizers. Now this is red iron oxide. So this is probably the most brilliant one that's uh, out of the bunch I'm gonna show you. We have raw umber, sepia, and one you may not be familiar with. This is yellow iron oxide. All of these are good neutralizers with different effect. Let's uh, look at uh, yellow iron oxide first. This is a color I recently discovered, and it's sort of a, a dirty yellow ochre. By itself, it's actually a little bit ugly. All right, so let's take our same phthalo green blue shade, put some of this uh, yellow iron oxide. Definitely tones down that brilliant green. If I add a little more yellow, and get some nice variegation in there. I'm not gonna do all of these, okay? You get different results with any of them. Uh, sepia being probably the most neutral, the closest to gray. It's got more black in it. Raw umber is a good one for a green neutralizer. Uh, red iron oxide kind of fits in its own category in that there's a lot of red in it, and red is a complement of green. So you're neutralizing in two ways, and we're gonna get to complements in a minute. And one more neutralizer to mention is uh, black. Now, I don't use black to neutralize things a lot, but the new Jane's Black is kind of interesting because it's a transparent black. And I like the uh, Jane's Black blue-orange variety. She has two, a blue-orange and a red-green. And I just recently did a review on this, so that's back in a video not too long ago. So that's this category that I briefly touch on. It's just using another color... Uh, usually a neutral tone. This is the least neutral of them, but another neutral tone to subdue and de-intensify your green. But it's a legit way of doing it, and you don't have to think about just like a black or a gray or a neutral tint. That's the point. The earthy tones work really well for neutralizing intense greens. And I did mention, and I just wanted to demonstrate this one thing, that neutral tint is really better while it gives you these blue, cool greens. It's really good at neutralizing really warm colors. Let's take Azo Green, for instance, which is a green gold. Let's add a little neutral tint to that. Let's see what we get. Still a green gold. As I've mentioned, neutral tint doesn't really change the hue. Just makes it darker and grayer. But it does take out some of that intensity. But what's great about this, any of this, is just it makes for really great experimentation sessions and learning what your greens will do. You don't want to be learning that while you're trying to do a painting. You want to kind of know where you're going to go to do what with what greens. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago on the convenience greens, I said I was going to come back to those because convenience greens can be, depending on what they are, great neutralizers in and of themselves, especially something like olive green or perylene green. Olive green this is uh, M. Graham's Olive Green is a very earthy, warm, almost a brown green. So I, I'm going to do a lot of demonstrating here with Thalo Green Blue Shade because it is such a common palette color. And it is so intense. And it is the one so often that is being neutralized or needs to be neutralized because it's so unnatural looking. All right, so here is Thalo Green and M. Graham's Olive Green. And you get this nice, deep, almost a hunter green this reminds me of the hooker screen I told you I used to use a lot. You pick up some of these puddles so you can see the color better. Isn't that nice? If I add just a little bit more of the olive, maybe lighten my wash a little bit. Still a nice earthy natural green, but it's got a little more intensity to it. Trying to figure out how to make your greens lively and interesting, natural looking, is just so much fun. And it's really something to do, you know, when you're not wanting to paint anything. It's just... Try your greens. Try uh, taking the most intense green, and I've spent really literally hours doing this, the most intense greens, and just playing with them, adding stuff to them, neutralizing them one way, augmenting them another. You may sit down for a half hour to do that and discover two hours later you're still doing it. <laughs> but make note of what you're doing and what works, and strategize that into your palettes. I don't have any perylene green. I'm not going to demonstrate any of these others. Perylene green is really great with some of the warmer greens. Well, that pretty much covers uh, the first method. 
using a neutralizing color or a neutralizing agent with your brilliant greens. So what's next? Well, the next one uh, is mixing with complements. I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit so you can see my palette. Most watercolorists know, if you've spent any time with color, is that uh, complements cancel each other out or neutralize each other. Red, green, those are complements. Blue, orange, those are complements. Yellow, purple, those are complements. But those are general categories. So generally, the one we're going to be talking about is red, green. Let's get out our most common intense green, and that's phthalo green, blue shade. Now, finding the complement uh, for a green uh, takes just a little bit more honing. You don't have to find the exact complement. You can be an off complement, and a lot of times that will yield interesting results. An off complement would be one that where you mix them. They don't combine to make a gray. They'll usually like be a brown or a blue or shift one way or the other. However, if you want to get close to the exact complement, uh, one rule of thumb is it's opposites in color, or complements in color, and opposites in temperature. Complements in temperature. So if you have a green, your complement's going to be red. If you have a cool green, your complement is going to be a warm red. So for this, I would choose, this is pure all red, and I can tell that's pretty close to an exact complement. But let's keep it green, so just enough to neutralize it, and let's see what we've got. Very similar to what happened using neutral tint. And that figures, because I have managed to find pretty much the exact complement, and it's just going to get grayer. And since it's cool, you know, we got this nice little cool foliage here. So what happens if we go sort of off complement? Maybe we want to make it, get some more uh, phthalo green out here. Maybe we want to make it warmer or yellow green. What are we going to do? Well, how about azo orange? It's sort of a brown green. Uh, let's move on up the temperature scale here to a yellow orange. Yellow orange with phthalo green. What do we got? Oh, yeah. That's a very sap green color right there. Very nice, usable color. Well, let's uh, use a different green besides phthalo green. I know that's the most common. How about if we shift something even farther to the blue? I don't have this on my palette, so I'm going to just put out a touch of this M-gram turquoise. This is sort of between a phthalo blue and a phthalo green, and you could do phthalo blue, too. This would probably work. We're in a greenish blue, but mostly a blue. Now, remember my rule of thumb, okay? What's the complement of blue, since I think this is mostly blue, and that's orange. But it's a cool blue, so a warm or hotter orange moving up the uh, temperature scale is going to be the complement. Let's try azo orange first. That yields kind of a brownish color, brownish green. So that's not an exact complement, but actually that's probably what we're looking for. That's nuts. Kind of earthy, almost olive green. And, uh, you know, if I put a little bit more of the turquoise in there, that's probably still a little unnatural. Get some more of that orange. Trying to make it turquoise and keep it uh, fairly natural. Well, that's pretty good. What about the Schmincke May Green? I don't have that on this palette, so I just want to demonstrate that my little rule of thumb one more time with a different color. My rule of thumb for finding a complement, or get it getting close anyway. This right here, uh, if you can see it, that's May Green. It's a very vibrant kind of spring green. I'm actually going to pull it over here onto my M. Graham palette. It is a very yellow green. So what we're dealing with is a complement is going to be a combination of yellow and greens complements, which would be purple and red, or sort of a violet, a red violet. So let's try that. I've got a quinacridone violet right here. It's mostly violet. Let's get some more green in there. Let's see how we did. Oh yeah. Let's see, that's fairly natural looking. So we kind of hit that complement right. But just with one simple touch in of uh, the violet, quinacridone violet, we've got a neutralized and more usable May green, at least for naturalizing the color, making it a little more realistic. 
Can add a little more in there to subdue it even more. All right, so we've covered using a neutralizing agent like earth tones and neutral colors like neutral tint and paints gray, sepia. Now we've covered complements, how to find the complement, how to use the complement. All of these can be used. The last one, and this is probably, I think, my most powerful tip, and this is where uh, you, I suggest as you're learning to tame your greens, get more interesting greens, this is where I suggest you spend the majority of your time practicing and experimenting. And that is with mixing. Okay, and I am going to definitely get my palette over here so it's visible. Now by mixing, uh, how do you get green? Well, everybody knows it's blue and yellow. Blue and yellow make green, okay. But just like with compliments, there's lots of blues and there's lots of yellows. But I'm taking it a step further still. I don't usually mix greens with two colors. This is usually the way, and my favorite way, to set up a palette when I'm painting greens and I want them to really be kind of variegated and interesting. And that's what I call setting up regions on your palette. I've demonstrated this before, but this is especially beneficial with greens. Let's go ahead and take this turquoise I had out. Maybe I'll add some of the phthalo green to it. Doesn't matter. I'm illustrating or demonstrating a concept here. Let's just say here we've got a nice cool green blue. You can make it more blue, you can make it more green, it's whatever you want to do. Let's get Azo yellow. This is a pure sort of a lemon yellow, a cool yellow. Right now I'm not interested so much in color as I am temperatures and sides of the color wheel. So we've got a green, a blue green, we've got a very, very greenish yellow, mostly yellow. In fact, you could break that region down even more with uh, a yellower section. Then right here, I'm going to put either an earth tone or a red or an orange. Again, that just depends on the effect you want. What I think I'm going to do, and what I have done many times, I'm going to use red iron oxide. Get plenty of it out here. You don't have to have your regions this big. I'm trying to do some of it so you can see it. And this is what I like to do. Mixing greens, you want regions where the colors can play. You you still can get, you know, a primarily a green, but, and I'm going to paint a bigger tree here just to illustrate the concept. And you can use all of what I've shown you so far. Convenience greens, brilliant greens, neutralizing colors, complement colors. You can set these regions up any way you want to, and it will make, again, for hours of experimentation and enjoyment. So actually, let's start up here. And my brush, you know, it kind of gets dirty going between these, and it does not matter. So we're going to make a tree. Here we've got a nice sort of a pale olive color. That's very nice. You might search and search and search to buy that color in a tube and <laughs> never find it, okay? Um, let's pull down here into some of this phthalo green, really intense. Now, mixing can happen in two places because it's going to happen here and it can happen here. So keep that in mind. And this is going down very intense, but by the time I'm done, that's going to change. In fact, let me go back and pick up some of this red iron oxide. Red's a complement, and that's a very sort of orangey red, so it's going to be a good complement for this blue green here. All I'm doing is just kind of touching in under some of these boughs just to give it a little shadow color. You see some of these, these parts here that are a little too intense. You can kind of touch that color in. Go up here and sort of make up more of a yellow green, more of an intense yellow green. See how interesting those greens are? And when I stop and think about it, and I, I force myself to get those greens interesting, variegated, and do the sort of thing, I'm always happy I did. But this uh, just really has real satisfaction and benefit. And it, it's funny because, uh, you know, the 
number one question I get from a lot of painters, especially beginners, is oh, what color is that? It's like, well, it's not one color. That's that's like four colors right there. And I'm just going to call this category, this final category, dynamic mixing. You could also call it regional mixing. That's yeah, kind of a boring thing. I just like dynamic mi mixing. And it's just breaking down colors into regions and being able to play back and forth between them. This works for any color, but it is really, really important, really, really successful, really, really useful for greens because you will paint so many greens in landscape, especially this time of year. And again, I, I want to reiterate, you can set these regions up any way you want. Let me, in fact, uh, just before we go here, one last thing, let me just wipe these and set up one more example so you can understand the power of dynamic mixing for neutralizing your greens. Let's go something completely non-green, okay? Um, let's, I have a cobalt blue here. Let's pull out what would probably be its complement, and this is uh, pure all scarlet. Let's throw that out here. So presumably we've got two complements. I pull them together in the center. Oh, it's not quite it, it, coming out a little purple, so it's not a perfect complement. That's all right. And let's get the olive green over here. I still think, and we, shall we go for a fourth? I still think I need a yellow so I can get plenty of green out of this mixture. So let's pull the azo yellow over in here. So now we've got a complement, a blue and an orange. We've got a de-intensifier, my first category a neutral, very earthy green. And we've got uh, the mixture that actually makes green, if you mix these two. So let's get the cobalt blue here. Let's get a green mixture going in the middle. Let's see where we are. Okay, that's interesting. Very much like the green gold up here. That's a green gold. Pull down in here in this blue. Get some, uh, a richer blue green. That's fairly vibrant, but it's not like overwhelmingly unnaturally vibrant. Let's pull some of that uh, pure old scarlet into the mix over here, maybe to get it a little more subdued. Yeah, and now we have more of an olive green. Kind of, kind of ran out of cobalt blue. Let's pull that back in here. Maybe so we have some cool shadows. I want to get Sort of a little variegation going here. I'm just going to pick up. It's all getting very dark. I'm just going to pick up a few little highlights here. So you can see some of the color a little better. You see in this tree here that we did, if I were to go back and paint that, I'd go mix up some different greens and paint in some shadows and kind of define those forms. But look at that. Isn't that interesting? Okay, I hope you get my point. And that was another form of dynamic regional mixing, setting up regions on your palette, doing dynamic mixing, using all of the uh, techniques in your toolbox, complements, neutralizers or neutralizing agents and de-intensifying colors, maybe even uh, convenience greens thrown in the mix. So get out your greens, do some tests, do some experiments. Find your favorite. And I know some of you out there, some of my veterans that have been painting a long time, help us all out. Help out those viewers who are going to go through the comments and look for ideas. Give them your ideas. Tell them what uh, greens you love to mix and what colors you use to mix them. How you make them interesting. How you make them dynamic. Put those recipes down in the comments. Beginners, if you're looking for some ideas for greens, better greens, Read through the comments, too. Hopefully this will give you plenty of ammunition. Here's another video I did on spring greens, experimenting with really bright spring greens. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.